Welcome. This is the February 1st Beehive Production User Call. We have Andrew, Rod, Patrick, Jan, Dan, Chris, and myself so far. The BSD CAN call for participation is open and closes the 12th of February. Uh, you are highly encouraged to submit a talk proposal. We welcome you as an attendee, and we would love to hear from you and your employer for sponsorships. Overflowing from the Jail and Zones call, Jamie reduced produced his first uh, review on jail descriptors yesterday. There's a link in the doc. That's exciting because that's pretty much a perfect follow-up to include, which was pretty much a result of the calls. And this is just the next step in that. So thank you, Jamie. And Andrew, you had a question on, has anyone used Open UDS? Uh, that is a component mentioned on GitHub with a license that I'm just fine with. And so I'm curious, have you seen this in production in any way, shape, or form? Do we even have just a screenshot or something about it? Um, I can actually show you the, I mean, you can go to the company's actual website here. Let me. Uh, virtual Cable SLU. Uh, virtualcable.net. Okay. Uh, Here, I'll I'm, link. Sure. I'm just slow. Oh, no. <clears throat> Solutions. Let's take your link instead of mine. It's cool. Magnifico. Oh, you got the Spanish version. Yeah, let's see what your link gives us. English, great, love it. BDI solutions. So, is there an exact component you want to replace with this? Um, I mean, the big thing that um that we're really looking at is okay. We need to do, you know, if I'm if I'm going to replace view or whatever VMware's calling it. With something else, I need something to handle. You're coming in. You've authenticated. Here is here is the desktop that you get, as opposed to here is the desktop that somebody else gets. And I think that's what this product is supposed to do. It's just a, it's kind of a replacement for that. Okay. <clears throat> and the first thing that came to mind to me was guacamole, but maybe they're kind of orthogonal. Apache guacamole. My understanding is guacamole is more the client component itself. Okay. Yeah. And in Guac fact, Guac guacamole is your browser based VPN. So you have remote access via RDP, VNC, SSH, Telnet to all sorts of devices over an HTTPS connection in your browser. In fact, if you go back to that GitHub page, mm -hmm. they have a link to Guacamole oh, okay. for providing a web interface. Are we talking about the Apache Guacamole? Yes. Yes. So they're also saying a lot about open source and a lot about demos and such. Do you know where they stand okay. on? that oh hello i Not can you. show you show you what that looks like Just bring it on love it web page you log in <laughs> i have two-factor authentication just a sec mm -hmm. and there you have your pre-configured -pre connections and then i just double click windows 10 and now i have an rdp client to my Windows 10 machine in my browser. And that's a Windows 10 machine on bare metal, on Beehive, on something else? In on Beehive, on TrueNAS Core. But that doesn't matter. Theoretically, it shouldn't matter. Yeah. Is your blog Gu 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 German 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 English? English. <laughs> that, that's a German installation. And your blog post about this? Pardon? And your blog post about this? <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not arm twisting, I swear. <laughs> um, what what did I just finish? Yes, I've, I've finished a uh, FreeBSD install instructions for Observio, just in case anyone oh, is nice. interested. I dropped in a link. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's in my GitHub. Very I'll, cool. 
I'll, I'll drop a link in the, in the notes. Awesome. The next thing I'm planning to do is instructions to get Grafana for true NAS core and open sense up and running. So I nice. have it. I just need to write about it. So yeah, as Grafana is a simple tool. It just lets you from anywhere in the world internet cafe if it's trustworthy enough and you're sure the pc is not infected with malware or in chromebook with a browser or anything and you access your your desktops at home cool. yeah what Have this you... go ahead what this does is provide the, a, the connection broker between whatever your client is be it guacamole or ID, rdp whatever and then to tell you then this is the this is the VM or physical host that you need to be talking to. Cool. Uh, let's see, Patrick, have you discovered any major shortcomings of Walk, or is it just treating you well? Of of this tool, you have guacamole. It's, it's, of guacamole, it's, it's treating me very well. It's great. That is great to hear. Is it absolutely in ports and within reach for yep, say? Yep, yep. Package and package install and uh, use. Period. Excellent. What what you need to do is you need to download certain Java modules, MySQL client library, for example. And if you want to use two-factor authentication, they have a module for that. Also, a Java library, and you just drop that into user local etc something something libraries, and then you can use it. Excellent. Welcome, John. Any questions for Patrick? Um, no, sir. Uh, just joining. Uh, glad to be here. I was Welcome. hoping to make it today. Oh, you've got the links to the ports. Awesome. Great. Yeah, I'm sure you'll find some recent news interesting. Uh, for example, Daniel and Zelta, but hey, those links are floating about. Um, segueing from Patrick to Patrick, thank you for answering some questions about UEFI VARs on in a true NAS context of all things. Uh, have you used that in production or simply those are the fundamentals you think would get it working? You provided some syntax here. Now that, that's what you need to do if you want to run Debian or Ubuntu or anything on, on true NAS core with Beehive as the hypervisor. Modern Ubuntu's they have the option in the installer to drop a bootloader in that uh, generic uh, default path. Mm -hmm. EFI slash boot slash boot x64 dot EFI, the, the last one. Mm -hmm. But uh, earlier ones and, and Debian don't. And uh, Beehive is relying on, if, if you don't start Beehive with certain command line parameters, but just fire up the, the machine, it looks for the bootloader in that directory. It's, it's as simple as copying a, a file around. And with, with a real machine and an EFI capable BIOS, you're supposed to set the boot variables so you can use the, the UEFI EFI BIOS as sort of boot selector if you multi-boot different operating systems and stuff. FreeBSD by default also drops the EFI bootloader into EFI FreeBSD something something and EFI boot boot x64 dot EFI. Very cool. Thank you. And so nothing nothing special going on here. Got it, Rodney. Any news on your multi-boot adventures, for lack of a better term, because it's not dual boot is from a single pool. Um, not much has changed there. I've, um, it's operating just fine on both uh, x86 and ARM. Um, I just got two new ARM nodes yesterday, so I am in the process of building up additional platform. But um, So I'll get to do another install from scratch twice. Nice. Okay. To see Excellent. how it goes, just to try and polish polish off the corners because I've you know I learned a lot the first time around. So each time I iterate building one of these from scratch, it it goes a little bit smoother. And hopefully by the time I'm done, I've got a pretty smooth set of procedures. There's some diciness. One of the part of the pool merging actually involves installing Proxmox standalone 
and then using the ZFS send to shove it into a FreeBSD created pool. Um, that's not really where I wanted to end up. I would really like to actually do a, a yeah, bootstrap type install, but I'm not there yet. Do direct any questions about Deb Bootstrap to Daniel Bell and perhaps Jan. So I know Daniel kind of introduced me to it. I'm kind of impressed with it. Cool. Excellent. Uh, on the topic of buzzwords, I saw this maybe an hour ago and it seemed to be recent. And someone's like, hey, it's OpenBSD-ish Kubernetes and stuff. <clears throat> so let's take a look. It is a port of... 1.2.9. Uh, John, I know you had some questions about Kubernetes. Let's see what they're up to. You got your assets, cloud controller, yesterday, and that's why I wanted to bring this up. Um, hmm. August. Uh, for your convenience, I will drop this in the chat, and you probably know more about this than I do. So if you have any insights and things to share, let us know, because uh, I will, uh, I'll, got I'll your I'll FreeBSD, you got your Lumos, so yeah. Cool. That's very interesting. Yeah, take it. Uh, enjoy. I yeah. Uh, there you go. Let's see. Back to the doc. Okay, so that was like yeah, yesterday. Uh, I'll put that in. Yesterday. Breaking news. Yesterday. Uh, F. Okay, so Antrenig is not here, but he found that pinning CPUs, if anything, got him a ten times faster boot performance and. Uh, when he's got his fires put out, he'll perhaps do some science on uh, boot time, run time, and other things like he did with the iteration of CPUs on a large core system. A uh, small bit of news. Windows Server 2025 preview is booting under Beehive just fine uh, for those who celebrate. Uh, Jan, you had a question about if lib locking requirements. Uh, tell us more. It's just that I looked into the problem Antonic encountered with the 25 and 40 gig uh, Ethernet drivers for the X710 integer uh, parts. And yeah, the problem is that it tries to allocate four kilobytes uh, without uh, waiting, so without blocking. And I don't look at the code and can't see why it has to set the no uh, blocking flag there and no wait. So I just wondered uh, if anyone knows uh, if it's because it's registered as, a, well, the function where the allocation fails is only called from one place and that's a callback registered with the if lab uh, virtual function table. So I wondered if there's a write up somewhere about the locking requirements these callbacks have to uh, observe somewhere because uh, the one function in between the methods table uh, doesn't require any locks as far as I can tell. So I wondered why it couldn't go to sleep uh, rather than fail because it's have... only for changing the administrative link state up and down supposedly. Do you have his mailing list post handy? I suppose I'll find it somehow. But he, this is that admin channel issue yes. we've seen in the past, and he is ripping his hair out. And also, mm -hmm. uh, I know we've talked about it on the calls, but there's obviously something still going on. So let me try to make this. So up this here is the error message uh, he runs into when, and this is also when passing through. So, and this message is only produced by one call set. There is the link and uh, ba, 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 ba. John D, I know you've pushed a few packets over the years and- uh, No, that's the link to the uh, Samba port. Oh, okay. oh, what the what? Bugzilla, oh, the, uh, oh, you're right. Miss Link, ignore the- Trying to multitask here. For the Anyhow. admin queue. Hmm. <clears throat> I 
I'd be tempted to go. I have to go look. I would go grip through the driver real quick and figure out where they're where they're. Actually, I think Jan did that. I uh, did that. Yep. Uh, let me grab my notes. So uh, it happens in line. So the allocation to them is line one thousand three hundred eighty eight in the this file. Oops. Damn you. Sorry. Here it is. Uh, uh, so uh, there's the location. Uh, this function is only called from one other function and not directly called. It, it looks like there's no requirement for it to never sleep. But I'm not sure because I have no the specification to check that against. And I don't have the hardware, so anyway, it's not like I could just try that. It could be as easy as just allowing it to go to sleep. It could also be that uh, putting the thread to sleep will break even more things. But I don't without the specification of the locking protocol it has to absorb, I can't even tell what it's supposed to do. I've pasted the, the thread I was looking for in the chat, let's see. Do, do, do. So he summarized that. I don't know if SRIOV or the memory allocation has anything to do with it. Let's see if there's a thread of that. Have you tried downloading the driver from Intel and trying it? He did, and it didn't solve the problem, if I remember correctly. OK. And the one in base is newer than the one in ports. Or something like that. Yeah. But that's for him to answer. I just took a quick look. Did the same thing you proposed, grab through the driver, okay. grab through the bug reports and didn't find one matching. No responses yet. Okay, uh, so right. you say the one in base was newer than the one in ports? If I remember correctly, that is what he said. Uh, I haven't checked myself. Okay. Okay, cool. So anyway, that's an ongoing fun one. Welcome, Mark. Uh, do you have any topics to throw on the table? And Mark, were you working on nifty vagrant things? Yeah, I cornered you. I'm sorry. Oh, while you gather your thoughts, uh, uh, Chuck Tuffley, a, a periodic wonderful visitor of the calls, discovered something on iSCSI CTL where these addresses uh, were all I, considered uh, different ones. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, what you got? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, no my worries. My microphone was muted because I didn't click the accept prompt. Um, a little bit of Vagrant stuff. I am working on a self-hosted repo of the Vagrant cloud so I can get away from paying the money. Um, that's about the only update. So just a simple REST API that imitates their stuff. Um, but no, other, the only thing I think that I can think of a topic is if uh, Andrew may have already brought it up, that's uh, stopping and starting a beehive zone or pausing and, 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 and suspending a beehive zone. Ah, uh, no, he brought oh, this up is the uh, new TM, which was quite cool. I believe it was, or some of her name. So yeah, uh, uh, do tell. Andrew, do you want to lead that off? Well, um, I just we just kind of wanted to know <clears throat> what kind of status there may have been. I know there's been some discussion going on about being able to do transfers of stuff, but it seems that that's kind of a superset of what you need to store to be able to pause a VM. So note that the, what, Monday 
uh, Oxide and Friends was about their new operating system that's finally out in the wild to some degree. So there may be bits in that. What do they call it? Helios, I believe. Uh, maybe you cocked it. Maybe not. Oxide and Friends. Helios. That was simultaneously an inspiring chat and a bit disappointing because I had a billion questions. But here is the video to that. Uh, it was a good chat. So uh, I'll just say see videos. And hopefully that's hit echoes. Hopefully that has hit uh, their GitHub repo. Oh. Yeah, you right? yeah. So, uh, did you, either of you, uh, uh, Mark or Andrew, catch that one Monday? I no, I was. wasn't okay. aware of that. Yeah, so Same. take a peek at that. Um, it, again, may have hit the repo, which is good news. Uh, I, you know, I, wish, I wish I didn't know these things, but somehow, yeah. Okay, Oxide. Computer, Oxide Computer, they get a bit cute on project names, but I won't fault them for it. Let's see. So, yeah, boom, Oxide Computer, repost, and do, 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 do. hopefully there's like, there's hubris. <laughs> Humility. <laughs> it's what I say about names. I mean, not wrong. Uh, Isn't humility the debugger for? Yep. Hubris or something like that? It is. It's exactly what it is. Um, propolis for Beehive. You got your console. What a boring name. Uh, anyway, so, oh, Helios. Boom. Uh, yeah, it's like, tell me your son fanboys without telling me your son fanboys. So there is a Helios repo. Take a peek and maybe there's something in there for you. Uh, because ironically, you're maybe at this very moment closer to having that Saber store than previous D is. But uh, Vitali has been invited countless times. He's got a review out there. Once two reviews, one's been accepted. Hopefully, the other is making progress, and we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, Jan, for what it's worth, I know you've probably spent the most time with uh, CTL and iSCSI CTL, but Chuck was surprised that these IPs that are to some of us, um, and to some systems, all one IP, they are all handled differently. It's an interesting comment of his. So if anything, a heads up, if uh, if that's a bug, that probably needs to be addressed. That so. looks like a bug to me. <laughs> yeah. The real bug, of course, is allowing so many different formats to uh, encode uh, IPv4 address as string. You can now even write place. it out as an unsigned uh, hexadecimal. Yeah, I mean it should. Con yeah, I would expect it to convert that to a exactly to yeah. hex. At which point the leading zeros don't matter. No, no. What I meant is, uh, for example, you could leave out inner zeros. Then you, yeah, so many notations FreeBSD still accepts, other than the uh, canonical one. Or if you could even call it canonical. So yeah, the only way to do it is to just run it through a system I inet uh, A to N function and uh, back uh -huh. again. And then compare the basically the binary. I suspect that's the reason why it notices the difference is because it does not do that for some reason but just compares the strings. Yeah, that's but strange. Only because it if you use H2M, couldn't you just not, uh, would, you, would you really have to go back to the string version? I mean, you could compare the, uh, for printing. the outcome. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, uh, I will relay that because, yeah, that doesn't sound quite right. Like, why are we not bumping into that in countless ways? Uh, that Because said, it's quite unusual. Uh, at least most of those uh, notations are very unusual and unknown to most. 
if you look at the code, uh, what the parser accepts, uh, you will take a step back. I'm seeing a lot of the DFS stuff here. This is the Beehive meeting, right? No, oh, yes. the yeah, the the Venn diagram is like just a circle. So, yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of overlap. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I'm on topic today, is all. Amen. But leading, leading zeros are not something we normally see on IP addresses, but still, it shouldn't cause a problem. Yeah. But missing octets. None of those are missing any, are they? No, 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 but that's also allowed by the parser. Oh, yeah, it's also, also allowed. Putting it in as one sit without uh, any um, dots, just zero X and then a hex number. It's also allowed. Or, yeah, or that, the de decimal integer. This is really yes, great. Without num exactly. Great to surprise younger folks. Just go to HTTP colon double slash and then some large integer and bam. Oh. Yes, that has already uh, caused several sites to get compromised because some browser <laughs> encoded, uh, understood the leading zeros as uh, octal versus decimal. That's so, interesting. And then you had basically your content filter and so on. Put an example in the it's chat. On uh, what an IP address or a URL resolves to. Oh, beautiful. I'm surprised that that is very effective because most virtual hosting software needs the needs the domain name in the request packet. And if you do it by sticking an IP address in there, it has no name to look up. So it doesn't know what vhost to dispatch you to. Unless they're running single domains per IP, which they're not supposed to be doing. Mm. Well, we, we, we were just trying to figure out a way to oh, hello, make use of the entire link. On Linux, they have this thing where you can basically make, you, you can have multiple sessions to the same one. <laughs> Wait, you're trying to trick the system into doing multi-path iSCSI by using different notations? We're, we're well, so, so making my so head hurt. What, what, oh. yeah, what, well, what's, what is the magic to be able to use the the full so we have a hundred gig link going between our host and our iSCSI target and we don't seem to be able to get much more than you know two-ish uh gigabytes a second so we're, if we're we're back to bdp problems and buffers uh, is Red, not two gigabits, but two gigabytes, is that? Yes. And you've hit, you've hit BDP. What's your ping time? Uh, the two systems are connected to the same switch. What's the ping time? Uh, I could, I, I, I don't know, but I could find out. Okay. Well, Chuck, so we had a great discussion about this, like, the, both this week and last week. Yesterday. Yesterday. Oh, sorry. No worries. Do, do I just need to go back through the... I'll, I'll go back through the minutes. Other, um, call. other call. A comment for folks real quick when we're talking about 100 gigabit. Um, the 100 gigabit link is com typically composed of four 25 gigabit links. And you can't typically have a single application consume that entire link. You can consume a 25 gigabit link but you would have to have the system going through multiple different paths as as defined by the driver before it would start to consume the other 25 gigabit channels. S SPDK is very happy to crush an entire 100 gig yeah, link. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not an issue. Hmm. Um, so if it's on the same switch I would uh, and 100 gig, I would assume the round trip time to be well below a millisecond. Yeah, around two to 300 microseconds is what it should be. Maybe 400. Uh, yeah, Slack, Slack is, Slack has died. Hang on. Said US, microseconds? Microseconds. U.S. <clears throat> not M.S. Oh, yeah, hold on. I'm spelling it out. I'm spelling it out. 
Patience. No, just U.S. I don't need to spell it out. You, what the funny U special character that I'll never find? S E. Nobody yeah. cares if it's a special character. I don't know what's with my keyboard. I just, yeah, no. It just vanished. Okay, well, feel free to fix that. Um, microseconds. Oh. So one of the problems is that uh, you still are only using one TCP connection, one SCSI queue, and so on. At those data rates, it could just be that you're single thread limited and you're running at 100% of one of your hyper threads. Is that inherently, so somehow I have skated most of my career not dealing with iSCSI at all. So I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, out in the weeds here, I feel like. Um, is, is that expected with iSCSI? Mm, yes and no. Uh, for a single iSCSI path, maybe um, there is an optional extension, but MPIO, multipath IO. But I think the FreeBSD initiator doesn't support it directly. And workaround you could try is to use geo multipathing. Uh, but that can have other downsides. But it's it doesn't require any metadata. You can set it up without to try it out and then just basically have two uh the FreeBSD initiator connect two times of a different path. And even if it's only to a different uh, port, not a different IP address, hopefully that gives you an independent connection which get, picks another path if there are multiple paths. And then you could reach higher throughput. Uh, yeah. But if it breaks down, I, GM uh, multipath can be a bit confusing to debug. And we have a problem uh, which could make it uh, not improve performance for you. Is that at least last time I checked, GM multipath for some reason was not marked for direct GM dispatching, which means that it all goes through the GM up and down threads, as if this is still the case. And then you have the next place where it becomes single threaded um, per direction. Oh, cool. But uh, I haven't rechecked in a while if anyone cleaned that up because uh, it's not really using anything which has to go for this. It's just that don't, during teardown, there's some problem which has to be fixed. So you can even do a free line patch and lie about it, but then it will hang on shutdown after it works for days perfect. But yeah, I only needed it for a three day event. So I didn't do the proper fix. So Chuck, yesterday we talked about some calculations based on, well, hey, you know, FreeBSD seems to be now tailored for 10 gig, but perhaps not better. There are several sys controls to Tickle, and I think even they were mentioned in a previous call. So hopefully we'll, we will all collectively spread wisdom that keeps us from bringing this up. And yeah, so there you go. Anything else Thank on you. this topic? No. Okay. Um, is the, uh, so, so the one thing that we were curious about is on that iSCSI control, is that just a, a, a bug or is that actively taken advantage of? I mean, is that on purpose? Just before you got here, a conclusion was a bug, but uh, I'm, I'm all ears. I I vote for bug. What I've been you saying I've been the bug is? My, I a control code, and um, I I don't take advantage of that. Um, but I process all my my values and validate them. Like sanitization Just, of those uh, IPs. a question. Could it be that it has to be preserved as is because the authentication uh, takes that into account as the destination in Spring representation or something for the challenge response authentication? 
Yeah, I think those. Uh, uh. I mean, the the easy thing would be to uh, throw something up on Fabricator and see what kind of howls ensued. But I, th I thought I'd ask here first. Anyhow, well, cool. Anyway, Chuck, nope, I'm uh, all good. Thank you. Okay, and Chuck, uh, there was a link about a Kubernetes thing from yesterday. I know you've been bumping into some buzzwords uh, now and then. Um, so anyway, it's it's in the doc there. I, okay. I wonder. I wonder if we pass that string ten dot zero dot zero zero one dot thirty six. If we pass that string literally across the iSCSI setup connection. Now, locally, we convert it to an IP that's used to produce the socket. I think that string gets passed literally. Um. And that's maybe why it's treating them as different. Because normally you don't use an IP number. You normally use the FQDN of the server checking the next sure. I, I would need to go look at the iSCSI protocol the connection setup thing but i think i'm almost positive we passed that string through literally i vaguely remember that the rfc has something where it basically binds the Challenge response identification to a specific target so that you can't um, do a confused uh, deputy attack. So that it may be that you have to preserve the exact string. But, mm. and it gets stored as a string in the configuration. It could just be that it waits too long to convert that. Anything else on that? And Chuck, I'll drop you a link on the, wherever it went. Yeah, the Kubernetes thing from yesterday. I, I know you were doing some, what's it, OpenStack and other buzzword compliant things, but this was kind of breaking news. Okay, that's in chat. Anything else related to that? It's a bit orthogonal, but I think we all really need to get our high-speed networking under control because if you're using Beehive, you're probably using both ZFS and a decent network. Um, Patrick, of your topics, could we briefly discuss the nice tooling on scrutiny? Somehow, I think John might have some thoughts there too. Uh, what is scrutiny? It's a disk drive monitor that uses uh, smart CTL on the system. Uh, you have a central instance that provides the web interface and an API, and you have agents that you deploy on the machines you want to monitor, and then you set up a cron job that, that feeds the web interface. It's um, rather bare bones. There is no, um, no authentication and no management of machines or something whatsoever, but it really provides a nice interface and it helped me to identify problematic SSDs in my company data center on our Beehive hypervisor machines. And uh, we are going to swap all of the drives probably this weekend. Let's see if I can quickly show you a screen. So Go-based, interesting. Sure, you can share. Do you also consume the GSTAT batch output stream? Which would be orthogonal about as I said, no, no authentication. This this is one of our large uh, AMD Epic all U.2 NVMe SSD systems, and for some reason, some of the SSDs throw smart errors while still pretending to work fine. 
I mean, this this Not system unusual. should and should in theory be completely broken because these two red items here are a mirrored VDEV. But well, can you open up and show what defect? Yeah, sure. Uh... They're still they're still working, and so we're going to replace them. A smart. What, a smart what failed error. is what failed is that these two devices lock. This number is exactly two to the thirty-two. Uh, media errors while still returning perfectly valid data in a ZFS scrub. A, or a smart ZFS. failure doesn't mean the drive has failed. Yep. A, a smart failure just indicates that the drive thinks it's going to fail in the future. Yep. And I, I know about that, but in this particular case, the uh, the drive is reporting two to the thirty-two media errors encountered. And that's but not unrecoverable weird. read errors. Right. Yep. Right. And I don't I don't know how you have your, your drive set up as for over provisioning. So when it finds a when it finds a block it doesn't like, it's going to it'll mm -hmm. reprovision that and move away from it. But two to the yep. power of thirty two is still suspicious and I would uh, uh, consider that more likely that either a specific subset of your SSD is unusable, which just happened to be four gigabytes, or that um, there's a firmware issue. And I was about to say, we've seen the firmware issues come up on SSDs before. I, yes. I, I guess, I guess, I guess it's in fact a firmware issue. But since these have been in operation for five years, we're going to replace the whole bunch of of drives. Better safe than sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the funny thing is that the regular tests that um, uh, FreeNAS or TrueNAS is supposed to run did not catch that because these drives do not support smart self-tests. Hmm. These are, you see Intel something 4510, I think is the series. Uh, enter enterprise, very high mm -hmm. run endurance, but um, yeah, I suspect it's the firmware. And um, scrutiny goes out and actively pulls the smart data of the drives every 15 minutes if you set up the cron drive that way. So it catches things mm -hmm. that smart self tests don't. And the other way around. Okay, anything else on that? I will grab control if that's okay. Boom, boom. And so I dropped in a screen capture with your serial number sanitized. So uh, that said, Chuck, I know we've talked smart, oh, smart over the forevers and Josh, welcome. And you may find that interesting. Um, Let's see, Chris, uh, one, how are you doing on your supervisor and how, uh, what questions do you have about position independent binaries, I believe? Yeah, right. So um, my, my, my stuff basically finally made it into ports and um, I suppose it's, you know, the birthright of every port that you get. Uh, Full out reports, uh, and I received some for I three eighty six, where for whatever reason the linker fails because it does not find the platform independent executable version of the libraries, <clears throat> which I find kind of confusing because it works on all the other platforms, just not on I three eighty six. So I'm wondering. Is this to be expected, or um, does any one of you guys have any kind of experience with that, or any uh, recommendations to work or how to work around that? First things first, are we talking? You're trying to target Beehive i three eighty six, which isn't quite a thing, <clears throat> right? That's you should like probably point. say we don't build there and have a nice day, no? Um, right, that's what I'm thinking too. So that was um, that was basically. My second thought that I could probably just update the make, the make file to um, to limit the platforms. Yeah. All right, makes sense. That's, yeah, it wouldn't. You, you'll be a really short 
trip on other platforms to quote Han Solo. The thing is that you, you would probably be able to compile it, but you would not be able to use it for, for Beehive, yeah. Uh, All if right. I do if I do a search of fresh ports, I'm not finding BM. Oh, state D. Let me try that. BM state D. Uh, I put the link there right there. Oh, you did. Oh, fills BM state D. Oh, thank you, thank you. Scrolls down to the link. Uh, other thoughts? Am I off base on what might be there? Oh, now I'm not seeing the link. Oh, link is a doc, perhaps. And fortunately, fresh ports is super duper fast, and I found it. I'll just grab it from there. Uh, ba, 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 two clause BSD, nicely done. Here's just in case you're missing it, I'll drop it in chat there and boom, drop it in here. Thank you, uh, in forwards. Any other build questions? We've got quite a few make file hackers here. Not at the moment. Well, I'm busy on working on the configuration parts that basically ties everything together with the parsing, uh, Part in Beehive config files and uh, the UCL config, and then basically putting everything back together. I'm working on a parser now for parsing the the Beehive config files. I'm not sure whether maybe you guys have any kind of recommendation if there's any any um, any parts that I could pull in, or whether it makes sense to build that from scratch. I don't know. There's just one implementation of that parser and that's in Beehive itself. Uh, I imagine. Yeah. All right. It's, so a, I'm, it's I'm... a cheap little ad hoc parser. Um, the question would be, do you really want to embed that? Because with UCL, you can uh, just slope in a file into a variable. There's a syntax for that to basically slope in, in binary data from a file into a variable. Or you uh, could uh, basically emit this configuration format so that you would. So there's a reason. There's CCL. actually a reason why I want to parse it. The thing is, um, if you have basically, I would I would want to allow the user to have a Beehive config file as well as a UCL based configuration. If you want, if you want basic stuff, then you basically start up with the UCL. But if you want something specific. And something more complex that you cannot do in the UCL yet, let's say, and you could put it into the Beehive config, and then you could end up with conflicts like I don't know, where in the Beehive config you put something on a PCI slot that um that for whatever reason you also specify in the UCL, and to be able to resolve and detect that, um, I need to be aware of what the Beehive configuration file says. So um. That's why I'm, the question that's why I'm is, would that, that be an error? Because in Beehive Conf, I think you can overwrite a variable. That's a very good point. Yes. So what you could do about, right, yeah. is not mm -hmm. pass it directly, but just have an option use, uh, which would expand into a dash O for Beehive to basically yeah. have a dictionary in or object in uh, UCL of key value mm -hmm. pairs. You would that and expand that into your argument vector for Beehive. Prepare okay, yeah. this, and then, then you could basically have an other one where you have a beehive conf so that you can basically interleave dash o and dash uh, k, uh, what is it, k, uh, mm. when build and you expand that without reasoning about it into a sequence of uh, dash o and dash uh, k uh, snippets where you would then just pass in the uh, configuration and the con beehive configuration could be uh, read into a variable so that you mm -hmm. would have a UCL configuration that just includes either single key value pairs or full beehive cons. Mm. If there's if one more thing that, 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 that would, in my opinion, still stand for pause in this file, because if you if you let the user write up the beehive config file, one of the things that I mentioned in the past calls, I think, is that um, you can't shoot yourself in the foot with the with, with the Beehive config file if you of course. if you misconfigure it. And I'm I also I also um, set up a very basic rule engine that basically would walk through the configuration and check for typical configuration errors and tell the user, hey, this and that is actually you should look at that because that's not gonna work. And 
if I if I don't parse the Beehive Council file, then then I'm going to end up again with the, basically I'm not resolving the original issue that I was also hoping to address. Uh, but but I, I suppose you I suppose from from a standpoint of you know getting things to run more quickly, you're still making a very valid point that maybe it makes sense to start out without it first, and it can still tie back in at a later stage. Yeah. The problem with your design is that you're basically guessing uh, be Beehive on its own configuration format, uh, yeah, which yeah. means that you have to stay in sync with any future extensions, which will trap up your validator, or at least provide a it, it would be stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It would potentially be stuff. You're totally right on that. And I was also thinking about that. Yeah. Very good point. On I understand the that, uh, temptation to uh, make sure you get it right. I looked into writing a SQLite schema to uh, hold exactly that and doing the validations with triggers and uh, check constraints okay. and so on, uh, just to model it out so that for a, a user-friendly front end, I understand which state belongs where so that, for example, you could move a uh, virtual interface you the user created between guests and what is part of the attachment to the guest, what is part of the interface configuration. So to really be forced to get the relationship right and understand what I wrote and have a computer validate that mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of just before I start hacking in shell and then end up with ugly states. Mm. But yeah. I don't know if this is useful, and I think I, I may have mentioned this a long time ago. I run a set of patches to um, have OEM strings working, uh, if you're familiar with that. And I'm going to post a little sample here, I think. Have you ever put that up as review? No, I have not. Um, and they eventually... Uh, did put some of the my original well part of the patch got included. Um, I don't remember who's what his name was, but this gives you the ability that I can just go in there and create these OEM strings, and then they can be dumped or read out. For instance, with DMI decode, yeah, um, which so, makes it very very simple to uh, we you know we have some instances where, for instance, I can shove a an IP address in here, and then we just have some startup code that goes out and reads it out, sets it up to what we want, does what we want, and then goes away or whatever. Um, and this is all done via the Beehive command line. So, you know, Beehive, blah, 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 dash O, OEM string dot one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as it, I could actually give a slightly, they, they currently support for instance, um, this is, I'm actually pulling one to match what I just sent you. Um, it would be 10. For instance, this. they they currently support serial, uh, system dot serial number, and that will inject that serial and you'll be able to read it out via DMID code or KENV, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another okay. one. Yeah, hello. Sorry, <laughs> you buried the lead on that one. <laughs> yeah, that is quite cool. interesting to use that, for example, to retrigger the first run scripts or something like that. Yeah, dude. Wow, that is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you okay? It's nice because it doesn't require any configuration to get through and is less invasive than using a dedicated block device for your configuration or something like that. Yeah, who do we have to thank? Like Beckhoff or who? That's that's awesome. So I I can forward this patch if you would like to see it. Oh, so it's purely your own patch that does that? Yeah. Uh, so well, I've, yeah, had a patch uh, yeah. that, I've had a patch that <laughs> did all of this for a number of years, and then they came in and they added the... Uh, the first couple of DMI entries, um, but we kept, so the OEM string is the only one I'm keeping uh, right now. Um, 
So just that, I just added this last one as an example, the chassis serial number. Um, I actually shove the real hypervisor value in there. So at all times, at least from boot, I can tell uh, if I, if I have access to the VM, it's, I can instantaneously tell where it's running. Yeah. There are a bunch of those twin values, and only some of them have default values. Uh, in none of none of these the, have none of the OEM strings have default values. They they know, are not created if you don't have them. But no, no, not the OEM one, but the other ones uh, implemented already uh, in Beehive. You, some of which would be available for hijacking. Uh, yes, some of them they do have a default, I believe. For example, our, the bias our... vendor defaults to Beehive, the version to the host system version, the release date, I don't know if it that makes any sense, then the system family is virtual machine and so on, so for auto detection. But then there are things like the serial number, SKU, uh, which have no default values, okay. the board serial number, the asset tag, yep, yep, yep. board location has yep. no default number, the chassis serial number, and asset tag of a chassis has none and so on. And those you could use to carry some of that information, but yeah, having OEM strings would be nicer. I'm, I remember seeing these on my real hardware supermicro systems and very frequently the value is to be filled in by OEM. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> classic. Correct. If you use the uh, supermicro sum utility, S-U-M, Mm -hmm. uh, it can talk to the BMC and you can actually, it has the uh, API to actually s retrieve and set those values to whatever you want. Uh, so you can act, that's, that's how you use a piece of super micro hardware to uh, implement your own, uh, your own product, which you then oh, ship to nice. the customer. Very cool. So you have a few added strings that aren't currently in Beehive, correct? In a patch that you perhaps are willing to share. I have the I have the OEM string support patch. Uh, uh, if you could, that sounds awesome. Bring it on. So thank you for that in advance, and thank you for pursuing all this. Because hey. Uh, Chuck, you may recall, I was proposing crazy stuff like synthetic smart values from a VM to simulate uh, so a VM can know if its host is having trouble or some broad uh, 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 d description of storage health and like, hey, should I migrate off of this system? So any of these sort of behind the scenes bits of information passing are awesome. Yeah, yes. this this sounds really cool. I'm... Uh... I, I I think I may have an opportunity to take advantage of this as well. Love it. Love it. Anyway, anything else? Why don't you pick it up, Chuck, and shove it in tree? Uh yeah. Yeah. If uh yeah, either get me the patch or throw it up on Fabricator and uh I'll I'll do the needful. All right. I'm not a hundred percent sure it's gonna pass all the syntactic sugar that's needed, but it, it, I know that it works. We've been using it for multiple years now. Okay. Yeah. We'll just, we'll work through whatever we need to. Tears okay. of joy. Anyway, uh, Patrick include links for getting Observium up and running on FreeBSD. Thank you for doing that. And as per my rant slash article slash whatever on stop blogging and start documenting, uh, hopefully it's like, you know, generic and maybe doesn't need to be in the handbook or wiki, but that's a whole different topic. But thank you for that. Oh, Mark, you kind of have a open ZFS question here about just stressing drives. Well, not even necessarily anything. Not necessarily ZFS, but the the point is, I'm trying to create like a multi-tool VM that will emulate the load that the 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 VMs are going to be using or running on for like our production workloads for things like Domino or MySQL or Windows machines. So I'm, I'm trying to get a kind of multi-tool. And right now, the biggest thing that we've been encountering in our in our big hosts is stress testing our disks yep. before putting them into large like hosts that have 30 or 40 arrays. So before we do that, we want to stress test them. So does anybody like 
have any specific commands that they would run inside of a Linux machine running on a, in a Beehive VM to stress test the disks in a similar fashion? Uh, well, first off, once you hit anything virtualized, your actual relationship with reality could get skewed insofar as maybe you're just talking to a ZFS arc instead of an actual disk. But um, I still think you might be on the outside world. And uh, I have seen something a bit on Linux that wasn't quite there. But in my perfect world, we have dtrace to FIO. What it would do is just use dtrace to follow your running workload and then generate a FIO script that can be played back uh, repeatedly at length. Uh, FIO is amazing and so far it can, as far as it can model workloads, but there are extremely few workloads out there that people have shared. So that's, I think, absolute fertile territory for a little more science. And so that would be something I'd run on the OmniOS host that the Beehive machine is running on. I'd run like the test workload on it and then I would have it record it and then I would model it. In a perfect world, yes. And there is one based on the Linux tools. I will attempt to find that. Yeah, that is the flexible. So there's layer. also stress NG, uh, and you can use it to mix and match different stress tests at the same time. I have to use stress and stress NG to use the CPU and RAM. Um, I, there's just so many different tools. I'm not sure. It's not you know, just a memory like, tester. Right, it's, it's RAM and CPU and disk, and it 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 does overall like it's 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 flexible. I understand, um, but I, the thing is, is that I'm kind of overwhelmed with all the different tools, and so I guess maybe I'm trying to find like the best tool so I can have more of apples to apples comparisons. Whenever I need to use those, it's <sighs> there's so many so different just, metrics, I just, and I don't know what's important. Maybe that's that's what I need to know first: what's important before I need to know what to stress. John jumped in there first, then Chris, go ahead. Yeah. I, I heard you use the word comparison there. Are you really trying to do a stress test or are you trying to compare a, a native hardware system to a VM? There, to, to, I, and I, 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 there's a difference to me if you're really trying to stress test something versus are you trying to do a performance test for comparative purposes? I'm trying to do both. I'm trying to have a benchmarking system so that I can kind of get, build up a, a, a host with a specific hardware uh, configuration. Once I have that, that up and running, I'm able to then spin up a set of VMs across five or six or triple mirror arrays. Um, once I get those results done, that gets me the benchmarking, like how it handles a, a like, like he said, the B-Trace FIA, if I had a modeled system, it would give me how the, the results of that would would run and the stress testing part is where i kind of burn in maybe burn in is better word than stress testing but the the disks and i i, I can know i can do that for like memory and cpu with stress and g but disks since i want to emulate the load coming from the vm should i not try to do it the same way i'm benchmarking it um well so for i can give you a for instance so if you have if you're going to be running a database load, um, your database typically is going to have a block size. And if you're you're trying to do some form of a stress, you really want to be running, uh, you know, something like FIO is perfectly fine to do a lot of IO in the in an IOPS manner at the block size that your database will be using. Five On the other four, hand, okay. if you're running statistical analysis where you're trying to linearly read through a terabyte's worth of data, you're not really interested in any form of an IOPS. You're much more interested in a throughput test where you want to have a much, much larger uh, read and read ahead. Uh, they're, they're very, they're very different things. Right. Um, and I, and I'm, I, I'm trying to get both because I have a need for both. And I guess I'm completing things because they're both involving disks, but there's so many metrics. It's just, yeah, so that that helps. Thank you. So I I do appreciate I'm, that advice. Go ahead, keep going. I, I I sometimes hesitate to say things in an open forum without a whole lot of back and uh, backing information. But I would go so far as to say is that you probably don't want, for instance, a database application uh, backing a store to be configured the same way that you would a 
a yeah, large share or, or you know many Apache terabytes or, of a right. linear data processing store um your your one is not necessarily optimal for the other right because you want to use different block sizes for the larger data sets mm -hmm. right and other other metric other right so okay so stress ng is the tool that comes out for for general stress testing and then the dtrace tool for modeling it um i i guess I guess you guys have answered my questions. So I can kind of regurgitate this later. I'll, I'll watch this later and and and. So, Mark, are you looking to make sure that you're hitting a certain performance goal? You have promised as SLA to someone, or and, do you want to know what your hardware is capable of with and without virtualization? Uh, it's the latter. I don't have specific goals. It's more that uh, we want to build a system that is faster than the previous and i understand that like you know changing from more cores to higher clock rates that also affects tests and it's not always going to be apples to apples it's going to be apples to all the other different fruits out there so uh, i just need to know how many it, how they all kind of stack up where i can measure them like in, in, in ways that they can so i guess more the second part of what you said I would probably add that it really very much depends on the software that you're running because um, I've had a similar experience when uh, we were setting up a, a new database ser server and we were uh, moving from AIX to, uh, to a CFS-based storage. And it was, I mean, the, the, original the original benchmarks were all over the place. They were looking good. And then we, then we put the database on top and basically just what, uh, what John uh, said, you no. Know, if you have the wrong block size, everything everything goes out the window. Uh, Andrew, can you just, can you clarify what kind of, how Domino kind of behaves in this situation? Like maybe that might give them no. a good benchmark. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what Domino does with anything. Okay, I wasn't sure if you could tell because of the way you've handled the host. So, um, so yeah, I have to ask Andrew. Uh, that that's our main main driver, but we also do other things like Windows desktops and a few other things like just simple Apache servers. We don't do any large database crunching. The most the largest database or largest arrays that we have are usually about twelve terabytes. A couple of NFS servers here, so we're just a general managed server managed service provider. So nothing exascale or by, by any means. So I would offer up one last uh, comment. One of the things that we'll do is the, the like the ZVOL, for instance, that you are allocating to a, a VM, assuming you're doing ZVOL. I don't yep. know that you are. Yep. Yep. But we will run uh, IO tests against the ZVOL device. And then we'll run that basic same test within the VM uh, against uh, the, v, the ZVOL storage and compare them so that we make sure we understand what the uh, what the emulation is costing us the overhead right okay Take care, andrew and and that can sometimes be very 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 informative now a way to organize this information <laughs> yeah so then hence me spending last like all this entire time trying to find these links on Linux block trace and FIO, I found an article that I've dropped in there where it's like a tip of the iceberg of, well, let's use block trace to capture some output and then let's slam it into FIO. So that to me is what the future looks like in this. So, And I mean, for those who touch things like ftp.cdrom.com, I would love to have a FIO script that just simulates its workload back in like 96 or whatever the heck, just because it's like, well, it's, you you profile it once you reread it forever so uh patrick i think you dropped in some notes relating to that you let's see uh current consensus seems to be on data sets matching the database uh, block that's, size. About, that's about that's about the, the database block size discussion that the that jan and, and john started and uh, benchmarks okay. by Clara at least suggest that keeping the block size at 128K and just letting compression do the magic uh, by far outperforms tweaking your, your data set to, to match the database block size. For example, just to give a rough number, um, I've seen in a system where I had to have someone 
um, with a very index heavy Postgres database, he had a five to one uh, compression ratio in the arc, which suddenly made the working set fit into memory again, which had such a performance advantage that write amplification was negligible compared to that because you're suddenly no longer waiting for the stupid rate controller you can't uh, lobotomize uh, to process the IOPS because all your joints now run in memory. That's, and, and, yeah, that's not a fair benchmark anymore. Okay. <laughs> we have strayed from Beehive and I don't want to stray down a super deep rabbit hole, but it should be on your radar. Patrick, who uh, has suggested that TrueNAS Core is your Beehive GUI available today. I put that in screaming letters there. It has been following <laughs> the discussion over on the TrueNAS forums about uh, mm -hmm. its uh, state and future. And there are countless off the cuff BSD dying our comments. And I've heard those for decades. And it's like, yeah, really? Okay, fine. Um, and thank you, Patrick, for linking to my talk on the free BSD appliance, because yes, that's precisely what I'm saying there and between the lines. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Patrick, do you feel there's something worth discussing in relationship to the plumbing of Beehive? Because I personally am disappointed that Beehive has things like excellent NVMe support, but TrueNAS Core doesn't give you that text string in the right place in the GUI. Mm. Or raw devices um, provided to TrueNAS VMs, et cetera. Go ahead. Well, TrueNAS Core didn't see a major update on any GUI improvements in the last two years or something, ever since version 13 was published. Feature free. So at the moment, we are all waiting on IX systems. They promised us 13.1, which will at least have a Redding 13 current FreeBSD user land and kernel. So we get all the VF improvements. I am running the nightlies on a test system, and Beehive is much more stable, specifically. PCIe pass through just works for me. This was the small system that I showed a couple of weeks ago, where I run OpenSense as a virtualized system inside Beehive on my TrueNAS, and then wire everything back because this box has four network interfaces. So I plug the TrueNAS uplink into the OpenSense LAN, and everything just works. So you know you have a firewall and a NAS in a single box. I really like that. Yeah, that yeah. said, uh, does, and, does and, the and then have I, any GUI changes, or it's still just FreeBSD updated under the hood, and then a deck? And I'm, a I'm not quite sure ago. what to expect. Possibly we can get NVMe because it's just a checkbox in the UI, and then some parameter changes for for the virtual device. Text string, but what do I know? I'm, <sighs> I'm not quite sure what to expect at the moment. Uh, it's just the same thing while they work on on fixing fixing bugs and, and making Zamba and, and everything up-to-date versions work nicely for the enterprise customers. Also, not quite sure what to expect uh, from the talk with uh, Ed and, and Greg tomorrow, but maybe we will talk about that. As I, I, I proposed in the, in the forum that if we ever want to turn this back into a community project, that I would propose to undo all the IX system changes to the FreeBSD source tree and solve any problems they might have solved for themselves either upstream or in a different way. So essentially, yeah. TrueNAS becomes a package that you can install on top of a, of a BSD. Um, some of the changes I know of are also specific to the clustering solution for the enterprise version of TrueNAS. Score. So yeah. the question would be, if they're abandoning that tool, would they be willing to share all of that and just basically have a read-only repository for others to dig through what to import, maybe, instead of... They, they, they are already sharing all the bits. The source yeah, it's is all wide open, fortunately. It's completely public. The, uh, the, the, cluster stuff, the, enterprise the, cluster, stuff. the cluster stuff only works on their hardware. That's the point. Well, need... all it really needs is a non-transparent uh, PCIe bridge, right? If you have one, but it, their hardware has it. So they, they found that it was too much work to have different branches and such. So it just kind of 
brands itself as needed. Uh, Patrick, in, con inversely to what you said, if they've made some genuine improvements to say Samba or other, otherwise, I sure hope those could get upstreamed as opposed to only sort of live and die in a Trunez branch. Um, yeah, my opinion is that underlying FreeBSD is getting so good as we see real time on these calls that it's like, well, <laughs> I'm finding appliances to be a crutch, but that's just it's me. Anyway, um, anything else on that broader topic? Uh, I don't think porting, say, the true NAS GUI to a Lumos would be a weekend project. It's a rather sophisticated component set of components with a very small number of people on the planet who understand them. But I maybe, Patrick, you've looked at the code and you've made changes internally and you think maintaining a fork is quite maintainable. Why well, use Trudas GUI and reuse the Webmin Virtualman GUI that I sent you an email about a couple months back? Yes, sir. <laughs> and in fact, that's a parallel discussion that's been going on. So yes, you found a way to craft uh, adjusted Solaris packages, was it, for Webmin to Illumos and uh, high five for that. Yeah, it supports CFS and runs Beehive Zones and VirtualBox with the Genix and Apache and all the goodies. You said so. it, not me. I have to just uh, stay neutral here, so I'm just going to shut up and listen to y'all. Uh, so yeah, uh, Patrick, let the appropriate people know about that call. I mean, hey, it sounds exciting. Go for it. Yeah. We could discuss the dying of a certain OS for another decade or two. It's like, yeah, okay, sure, what, whatever. That's not <laughs> helpful. Go ahead. Looking forward to celebrating 40 years of FreeBSD with you, Michael. Yeah, and Unix, the number one OS for replacing Unix and developing Unix alternatives with for 40 to 50 years. Like, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, Dan Langell, you got anything? I see you're unmuted and you've been quiet and probably in a call earlier. And who else has not had much attention? Uh, I have an orthogonal topic here that, that can wait. That's just like, and actually maybe the Illumos folks can point this out. I'm, I'm just delighted with uh, Z ZFS delegation insofar as, oh, this user is allowed to send and receive and absolutely nothing else. Well, that's transparent. I love it. And if that could be on more apps, mm -hmm. That would be great, but apparently it might be managed in Illumos using the SMF uh, security framework. Oh, here we go, service management framework. So anyway, food for thought. Maybe we can have nice things. Any other topics? Uh, for Chris, well. yes, I Jan. just looked over um, VM state D as it is. Have you already uh, tried to use it with CTL and Vitao SCSI because it requires a, the pre-start and basically any way to get that in. No, not yet. Jan, I think you're the world's uh, expert on CTL and Virtio SCSI such that uh, if you've got helpers to share, share them, please. What you mapped out of six months ago or so was very cool. I know you had some issues, SCSI. I know you had yeah. some issues with like keeping a LUN only visible to one VM as opposed to, hey, everyone's a winner. Um, no, no, uh, there aren't really issues. It works as uh, intended. Oh. You, it's only that you have to make sure to configure it because by default, every CTL port uh, you can use for that IOS uh, has access to all registered LUNs, but there's a, a feature called LUN mapping built into CTL where a port can have basically virtual LUN numbers, which are local to the port. And then using this, you can basically, you can think of it like port forwarding on a NAT where you have a different address space. So you have the global table of registered disks uh, or memory disks and other targets. And then you have the ones and they map to the global ones and only the ones you can address are usable through the port. Okay. That works as intended. Uh, it's just a bit annoying to set up using the available command line tools. Okay. Uh, Jan, did I read you correctly on the, uh, on the, on the mention of uh, CTL and Virtio? Uh, 
Do you mean I should probably update the RC script to uh, to make sure that it is uh, started in the right order? Is um, that what you're you doing as well? Or? Well, not really. Because because I don't have that in yet. Wait, uh, CT, this is not related to CTLD, and it's CTLD is if you want to run an iSCSI server or a fiber channel yeah. server, basically. Yeah. Right. Uh, CTL could provide hot pluggable backend storage. Exactly. CTL can basically uh, be used to with the VidIO SCSI uh, VidIO driver, uh, which is commonly yeah. supported and implemented in Beehive. You can basically have the virtual right. HBA, and then you can use that HBA to access your block devices. Right. Okay. On the yeah, host, yeah. Okay. And then the oh, host can decide. Okay. At runtime to uh, add new devices, what's missing so far is that there are no hot plug events generated. So you mm -hmm. uh, either have to, there are two ways. You can either wait or manually rescan, or you can inject an error, um, which will cause the common hosts to rescan after the error, which isn't nice. Uh, you can basically pretend that something bad has happened. And then uh, the operating system will commonly just rescan the bus and be happy, but it will shout at the user and confuse the user. And the proper way would be to have a, but I haven't found a way to inject a please rescan notification. Yeah. So is a true command, like true aimed at the device do a rescan? I recall that being needed in some circumstances. No, you would use uh, something like cam control. Okay, uh, rescan all. Rescan all in the guest or rescan this bus. You can limit it to a specific SCSI bus. Cool. Uh, that said, wasn't Rob Wing working on some form of hot buggy well, notification-y things? Anyone have a memory of if that? If you remember correctly, that was for uh, resize notifications and has made it into 14 so that you can resize the device and you get that event at least for some backends. I think for a vidIO block and NVMe and maybe for SATA emulation as well. Cool. Okay, Daniel B, when did you slip in? I don't know if you've been following along. We've covered a lot of territory. A lot of it's close to home for you. I don't know where to start. I snuck in late. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do a quick look over this. There's some great references to ported software, to things like OpenUDS, to a, a, a fleet-wide smart tool that Patrick found, to long discussions. So, yeah. Go ahead and catch the recording. Do you have any questions and news for the group? No, no beehive excitement over here. <laughs> cool. Um, that said, anything else? Or should we call it? Um, one question, uh, which is a problem all beehive manager uh, front end says is how to deal with console uh, multiplexing. Mm -hmm. Um, so the uglier startup scripts uh, for FreeBSD do things like just running Beehive in foreground in Tmux. And that's not really a valid solution because you can accidentally kill it. The proper solution would be something like using an NMDM device or mm -hmm. maybe even a physical Compot, if you really have to. Uh, Jan, can you explain your what was going on with Tmux? I'm, I didn't understand. He mentioned okay. it can be killed. It's just another process that might it be can be kill. killed by know. accident. Uh, yeah. You basically it stays in the foreground and isn't cannot normally be shared correctly. You ca can uh, kill Tmux without killing uh, Beehive in some circumstances so that it then runs basically headless and you can't reattach. Do you have so, a workaround, a better fix? So go ahead, Don. I use, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, the reason I'm trying to understand is I use Tmux and mm -hmm. I start Beehive connected to SoCat. Um, and then I use Tmux to attach to the opposing side of the SoCat process. And I can you know, I can then bring Tmux up, and if I have 20 VMs running, 
you know, control B S will give me the entire listing. I select what I want and I go there. And if I kill T Mux, then I can just reattach to the, uh, the, to the SOCAT side and, and Beehive continues to run correctly. Um, I never, I, maybe this is different from you. I never want anyone on a TMUX session to be able to kill the Beehive process. Exactly. I don't want that either. But what I would li like to see is basically have a captive similar to a very stripped down terminal multiplexer where it runs as the pseudo terminal master and connects its slave to Beehive. Beehive can write to it and then multiple others can attach to that so that you then have the option of basically through the management to reboots it and see the boot screen again and so on. So that, so that someone can just SSH into the system and get a command line uh, look at the virtual machine with the option of maybe for Tmax have one screen, which is just a virtual machine and the other one a captive user interface to manage it, to start, stop, halt, re restart and so on. This would be what I would like to see so that we don't have to have a web interface and all of that to run anything which supports a serial console as system console. I think I'm doing something really close to what you're asking because I, when I and bring up when I bring up T, uh, Beehive, I'm using the an NDM uh, entry, and I connect that to SoCat, mm -hmm. and then the Tmux connects to the SoCat uh, socket. Um, okay. And that's a serial. That's a serial port, so I can reboot the system inside of Tmux, and I see everything and can control it. If I SSH into the box, then I just get a standard, you know, uh, a standard terminal session, and there's no, there's no, there's no graphic required. And as a matter of fact, I have I have graphic turned off everywhere. It's not even allowed. So my uh, goal is to have something where. I have a host, someone can SSH in with a force command or a certificate or something. And then they would through PAM jail be thrown into a jail. And then there they run their access to the Beehive running in another jail. And they can communicate via Unix sockets between that, uh, isolated from the host network and can um, access each other only through the NMDM device, which it's already possible, but how to basically put it all together? Um, there are lots of options there. Sure. I mean, I'm happy to post a couple seg you know, snippets if it'll help. It sounds like you're doing something a little bit differently than I am. So what I do is I embed the guest name in the NMDM device and the serial port number. So I have something like NMDM guest name dash com then port number one to four, and then A and B. I do something very similar. I embed the actual serial number of the VM into the NDM uh, name. Yeah. So uh, because I want to have two or three, but I because it doesn't cost much, I just create all four uh, COM ports so that I can have the system console on the default one and use the second console uh, basically for lock for warning and then consume that with a, on the host so that the second <coughs> uh, serial console is just basically used for the uh, kernel log messages. And that those are safe to a log file on the host because the problem with a serial console is if no one is watching, everything gets discarded. You can't scroll up like yep. on a video console. Yeah. So I, I have my Tmux sessions are permanently there. So I I and I have about I think I have them set for fifty thousand lines of history. Yeah. Um, and so, you, so I'm not sure. Maybe that might, might be a difference. Um, if you've got so when, syntax, I, when I attach to, for it. when I attach yep. to Tmux, I'm attaching to a session. So and you're running the uh, SoCat. Okay, that makes more sense. So 
what you're doing is you're putting the uh, SDRL uh, TTY in raw mode and then connecting to the other one and just use it to forward one TTY to another instead not you're running a beehive with silicate as STDIO. No, okay. no. That, then it makes sense what you say. <laughs> I've been running this way for a number of years now. And um, at least so far, I've had no issues with it. Um, permissions are set up so that a a, a non-root user can log in and get access to the TMUX sessions. But to your question, Michael, they don't have permissions to run that kill. And uh, they have no way to log out uh, out of a SOCAT without uh, doing it via TMUX, right? Because uh, the SOCAT will eat control C and other control C Correct. sequences in that configuration. Everything, go, everything passes and goes through the way you would expect. I normally use PicoCom so that I can get back out to the script running outside so that I can basically drop out of PicoCom uh, into my shell script again, then get a little menu with options to reboot, restart, and so on, and then throw me back into the uh, thing. And your normal CU would also work, but I prefer the PicoCom. Uh, behavior. Let me uh, see if let me get one. Sorry, I'm digging through my an active system here, looking for yeah. the exact sequence. Um, I thought that would have been there. Chris, do you have an example for a VM state D configuration you can share or put somewhere? Oh, Just I wish example, I could uh, VM directory. That would be so nice. Um, because, uh, yes. To John yes, on I his can, new project. Can put something for that. Go ahead. It would be really nice if you could just create an example uh, folder yeah, and put that's a, a good point. dummy in. We'll Even do. if the scripts are empty and just have a comment in them or emit a bit of output to say, hello, I'm the so-and-so hook. Yeah, I will, I, will, I will do that. All right, hang on. I'm I'm trying to put something in right now. Tmux oh. uh, dash f tmux conf And you can drop it straight in the dock if you like. I trust you. It's your call. It's your dock. Oh, that's fine. Hang on. Um, that is what a Tmux initiator looks like. So when I initiate a Tmux session in the tooling, that is what I run, which runs the SOCAT. And if the SOCAT dies, this whole thing will restart and continue recapturing without losing my TMUX history. Which, so if I have 50,000 lines of history, I don't lose it because I didn't lose yeah. my TMUX session. I just yeah, reattach. Um, and I also have tooling which allows me to do a, a capture pane from TMUX. So if I have someone who says they are having an issue, um, I publicize a, a mechanism that allow, allows them to do a get console, which goes back to the TMUX session and will go grab up. I think I get allow them to grab up to a, about 10,000 lines right um, now. Okay, yes, something. Done. Let him finish. Uh, sorry. No, John, I'm done. Go ahead, John. Your setup would lend itself to the watch a command from FreeBSD base. Uh, sure. You could put it on the, because the uh, NMDM device should be a TTY line, it should support uh, sniffing it with a watch so that you get a basically a backlog uh, to basically continuously observe the TTY. 
and then you would get uh, the option of replaying that. Mm -hmm. Food for thought. Great work, everybody. Anything else? I'm going to call it at 43 after. Thank you. That was fantastic. We're talking tears of joy here. And I wish you all a great weekend. See you guys. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Bye.